Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? All right, so uh, I'm from Detroit, and so we, I have to, um, of course, greet you in Detroit greeting. What up, though? <laughs> All right, so it's good to see y'all here. My name is Jamon Jordan. I'm a historian, um, and I focus primarily on Detroit's African-American history. And so I'm going to give you a little slice of that today. Um, so you're going to take a, a deep dive into a portion of Detroit's African-American history. Uh, I am a historian and, 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 and tour leader for Black Scroll Network History and Tours, which is a company that um, talks about, teaches, and takes people on tour sites of historical African-American um, um, places and events in the city of Detroit. And so our presentation today is about two former historic African-American neighborhoods in the city of Detroit, which really were the foundation of the creation of the black community, first in Detroit and even now in the Detroit area. And so many people don't know much about these communities or how they came about. And so uh, and since they no longer exist how they did in the, from the early 1900s to the 1950s, you kind of have to study them from a historical standpoint because you can't just go to Black Bottom and Paradise Valley today. So that's what we're going to be doing today. What you see there, it, are, these, are these? Oh yeah, these work too. Okay, good. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. So um, what you see here are three historic sites in former Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. The first is the site of the first Michigan Colored Regiment, which is in camp on, which was was on Camp Ward. During the Civil War, 200,000 African Americans joined the Union to fight against the Confederacy, and over 1,000 of, the, of them joined from the city of Detroit, and they formed the 1st Michigan Colored Regiment, which became the 102nd Michigan Colored Infantry. Uh, and that is in Black Bottom. On now what's there is Duffield Elementary School, which has been renamed to Ralph Bunch Elementary School because Ralph Bunch is also from that area and went to that school. Um, Fannie Richards, the first African-American public school teacher in the city of Detroit, lived in what was Black Bottom, and so her home site is a historic site. And this is the Paradise Theater. This is actually a site that still exists today, and we'll talk about what it became, um, but it comes out of Paradise Valley, which was this black business district. So I am also the president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History's Detroit branch. That organization, the original organization, is founded in 1915. It is founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It's existed for 103 years. We just had our 103rd conference, 103rd annual conference last week or this last weekend. And um, that organization is responsible for founding what is now Black History Month. So I'm the president of the Detroit branch of that organization. And so here's a couple of quotes that I, I want you to think about. One of them, until the lion has his own storytellers, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So we know that if, if, a, lion, um, if, a, if, a, if a lion hunter would tell you how he hunted and killed a lion, he would probably make himself a big hero. I, I, I wrestled him to the ground, I beat him down, and with my bare hands, I choked the life out of that lion. Now we know if the lion could talk, the lion would tell it totally different. The lion would probably say, he snuck up behind me and with a big shotgun, he shot me. But had I saw him coming, I would have eaten him. But see, the lions don't have storytellers. So the tales of the hunt always glorify the hunter. And that's the way, for many, in many cases, the way history is done. The people who lost in certain historical events aren't able to tell the story. And then another African proverb is, by the time the fool has learned the rules of the game, the players have all gone home. And so um, you know how that is. If you um, play in a game, let's say it's poker or some other um, game of chance, and you don't know how to play, 
or pool or whatever, and you don't know how to play. By the time you figure out how the game is, is supposed to go, you've lost all the games and everybody's gone. And if it's a gambling game, they've got all your money. So we have to correct this. And so it's, it's, a, it's a daunting fight. But it, people like me who are older, we're at, the, we're at the end of our fight. But you are at the beginning, and you can make changes that old folks like me cannot make. And so we have to fight institutions. This is the Michigan Historical Societies. I'm sorry, the Michigan History Centers. That's the main museum for the state of Michigan. It's in Lansing. This is the beginning of African American history at that museum. The first panel that discusses African Americans at the Michigan History Center says this. Michigan, a free state. Michigan was an anti-slavery state. This was a result of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the political and religious beliefs of the population. The Northwest Ordinance specifically prohibited slavery. By 1860, one-fourth of Michigan's population had come from New York State. There, religious revivals inspired reforms, including temperance, no alcohol, and the abolition of slavery. Other Michigan settlers came from the abolitionist areas of New England and Ohio. So basically, the way that the Michigan History Center teaches the beginning of African American history in Michigan is that Michigan is a haven for freedom. That's how it starts. Michigan is important. It was always good, at least on the issue of slavery. It, it, it didn't have slavery. It was founded as a free state. The people who run and are historians at the Michigan History Center, I'm not smarter than them. I don't know more about history than they do. They know there's something wrong with this story. But this panel went up anyway. It's what I call the epistemology of ignorance. People, so some things are mistakes, and some things are purposefully put so that people don't know the truth. And people at the Michigan History Center, they know the truth. And we will talk about that truth in a minute, but I'll just say it. Detroit had slavery. Michigan had slavery. They knew that. The people who created that panel know that but they're obscuring a portion of Detroit's history to, and a portion of Michigan's history to present Michigan in a favorable light. This really began after the Civil War. After the Civil War, the North and its historians wrote themselves as the good guys and the South as the villains. So the South represented everything bad, slavery, lynching, segregation, Jim Crow, and the North was not, all, no, not any of those things. No slavery, no lynching, no Jim Crow, and all of that is a myth. These are three historical markers. The Michigan Historical Commission goes over each marker and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, sanctions what's on that marker. You can't read it, but I can. So. The one that's the Lake Erie one, which is on the far left, your left, um, that's the Lake Erie Michigan marker. It says, named for the Erie Indians, this was the last of the Great Lakes discovered by white men. We can stop right there. It's a problem. So basically, it's presented as if the Lake Erie was discovered by white men. And we know that the indigenous people, the Native Americans were using Lake Erie thousands of years before white men found it. The next marker, the next marker states uh, is Finney Barn marker. And I'm not going to read all of that, but Seymour Finney is a hero in Detroit's history. That marker is in Capitol Park in downtown Detroit, which was formerly where the capital of Michigan was. Capitol Park in downtown Detroit is named that because that's where the capital of Michigan was before it moved to Lansing in 1847. So during the time that Michigan is a territory, and for the first 10 years as a state, the capital of Michigan is Detroit, and the capital is in what is now Capitol Park. And Finney's barn is across the street from the Capitol building. And Finney owns a hotel, and he has a barn for the people who stay at his inn where they can store their horses and their wagons. Finney is a, an abolitionist. He's a Quaker and he's against slavery. 
And behind two tons of hay in his barn is a hiding place for people escaping from slavery. And so this marker was put up to honor him. But Finney, who is a white abolitionist and is a hero in the city of Detroit on the issue of slavery, has a partner. His name is George Dollarson. George Dollarson is the conductor on the Underground Railroad. And just so we're all on the same page, the Underground Railroad wasn't underground and it wasn't a railroad. All right, so it wasn't no um, subway from Mississippi to Michigan. It's a series of routes, places, and people who were involved in helping people escape from slavery. And they use railroad terminology like conductor, station master, station. And Finney is a station master. His barn is a station. The conductor is George Dollarson, who is a um, custodian at the Capitol building across the street. The marker does not mention George Dolerson at all. There is no marker in the city of Detroit that mentions George Dolerson at all. The information we get on this marker for Seymour Finney did not come from Seymour Finney. It comes from his son, Jared Finney, who was a United States attorney. There used to be a school in Detroit named after Jared Finney, Finney High School. Um, it's now East English Village Preparatory Academy, but that used to be Finney High School. And Finney told us, Jared told us about his father, Seymour. But he also told us about George Dolerson. So in the memoirs of Jared Finney, he extols the greatness of his father in the Underground Railroad, but also extols the greatness of George Dolerson in the Underground Railroad. But the marker only mentions one, Seymour Finney, who is a hero and deserves a marker. But there's no mention of the African-American leader in the Underground Railroad. Why is that? So the short answer is, and I always get it, is racism. That's the short answer, but we can get more detailed than that. In 1977, there was a four-day miniseries. For a long time, it was the most watched miniseries in American history. Anybody know the name of that miniseries? Roots. I was, I, as a child, I was forced to go in the house every day and watch that miniseries. My grandmother didn't play. So I had to watch that every single day. After the miniseries, each day of the miniseries, people went, to their jobs, they went to school, and there were confrontations in jobs, in school. Some people got fired, some people got in trouble. There were even a few fights broke out over roots because it was hard feelings about this issue of slavery being put on the screen. Many historians and institutions, much, much of which were led by European Americans, felt that roots presented whites as villains. And if you watch it on a surface level, there's some truth to that. But if you watched it intently, you saw that there were whites who were abolitionists in Roots. And all the whites weren't slave owners. There were whites who were against slavery in Roots. But if you watch it on a surface level, then you won't get all of that. And so historians, institutions, museums began to look for white heroes that they can build historical markers and monuments for to overthrow what they thought was the misrepresentation in roots. And so markers go up in Ohio, they go up in, in Massachusetts, they go up in New York, they go up in Philadelphia, they go up in Detroit. After 1977, between 1977 and 1985, over 300 markers go up honoring white abolitionists. They're responding to roots. This one goes up in 1980 and it is a response to roots. George Dolison is not mentioned because George Dolison ain't the point of the marker. This other marker is Orville Hubbard. How many people have heard of Orville Hubbard? All right, so Orville Hubbard was a 30-year mayor of Dearborn, and he was a strict segregationist. And he, has this, he had this phrase, he, he, he made sure that he kept African Americans out of Dearborn if one ended up somehow getting a home in Dearborn, then he would send the police to their house at all times of the night to knock on the door and send the fire department with the sirens uh, coming to the house as if the house was on fire until those people were annoyed every single night and to move away. And he, his phrase was, keep Dearborn clean. And he was not talking about the streets being swept. He was not talking about getting, picking up the garbage. He was talking about keeping African-Americans, keeping black people out of Dearborn. 
And in, in some speeches, he just said it outright. He didn't use a euphemism. He said it outright. I'm keeping them out of, out of Dearborn. This historical marker in Dearborn talks all about Orville Hubbard, but doesn't mention what everybody knows, that he was a strict segregationist to keep black people out of Dearborn. In fact, they even mention on the other side of the marker that his, his phrase, keep Dearborn clean, but they talk about it as if he was talking about the streets, and everybody knows that's not what he was talking about. So even historians and institutions in Michigan have been complacent or, or complicit in making sure that a certain narrative in Michigan gets told, which omits or lies about Michigan's history. And so now that brings me to Black Bottom. When Black Bottom gets discussed, or had been discussed for many years, it was discussed in these ways. It was a slum. Black Bottom was full of crime. Another myth that gets talked about about Black Bottom, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley are the same place. So sometimes you'll read something historical about Black Bottom and they'll be talking about Paradise Valley. Or you'll be reading something about Paradise Valley and they'll be talking about Black, uh, Black Bottom. And then sometimes you'll read something about Black Bottom and they'll put it wherever black people live in Detroit. So you'll have um, some event that happened on the west side, like the 1967 uprising, and they'll, people will say that that happened in Black Bottom. Ain't no Black Bottom on the west side. Um, and, and then the other thing is nothing good came out of Black Bottom. So this is the wrong view about Black Bottom. Here's an improved view of Black Bottom. Thousands of African Americans left the South during the Great Migration in the early 1900s. Many chose Detroit because of the job opportunities, especially Henry Ford's offer of $5 a day to all workers. Because of racial restrictive covenants and other forms of housing discrimination, most African Americans were forced to live on the Lower East Side in the area bounded by Gratiot, Brush, Verner Highway, and the Grand Trunk Railroad, which is now St. Alban or the Dequinder Cut. Near Black Bottom was a business and entertainment district known as Paradise Valley, where African Americans were able to own restaurants, hotels, clubs, stores, and other businesses. This view addressed Detroit's Jim Crow system, which for many years was hidden. So now we know one of the reasons Black Bottom becomes this historic area for African Americans is because of racism. African Americans cannot buy property in most cases. They cannot buy property all over the city of Detroit. It's only certain areas that they're allowed to buy property. And one of the main areas is Black Bottom. So this skips over some of the missing history of those markers and those panels from the Michigan History Center. This one is, is a better view. We're learning something else about Michigan, particularly Detroit. This is a um, racial restrictive covenant. It states, that said premises shall not at any time hereafter be sold, leased, or transferred to any colored person or persons, or to any person or persons of the Ethiopian or Semitic race. So I don't have to read the rest, but this is a racial restrictive covenant. It would be on the deed itself, or it would be attached to a deed. And it would, the homeowner would either put this in the deed, or they bought a home and it was already in the deed and they signed it. That way, when they got ready to sell it, if they were ready to move away, they would have to abide by this covenant, this agreement. They agreed not to rent, sell, or lease to a colored person, or you could say Negro in some periods of time, or African American today. And in this case, they have a second group that they also are not gonna sell to. Did y'all catch that second group? Say it. Ethiopian, Ethiopian that's, that's other black people. And Semitic. Who are they talking about? Jewish. They're talking about Jewish people. So on all racial restrictive covenants, black people were on them. You could not, rent, if, it, if a house had a racial restrictive covenant on it, black people couldn't be rented, sold, or leased to. On many racial restrictive covenants, there's a second group. And if there is a second group on the racial restrictive covenant, it would be Jewish people. 
And because of that, Jewish people and African Americans will live the longest together in and around the city of Detroit. Because African Americans would always, if there was discrimination in housing, they would always be discriminated against. And Jewish people would be the second group most likely to be discriminated in housing. And so this racial restrictive covenant identifies two groups that you cannot rent or sell to. Some racial restrictive covenants go in more detail. They would say, you can't rent, sell, or lease to a Negro. And if you get a maid or a butler, a servant, they can't live there. Some have a little bit more detail. You can't even have your maid or servant live there. Some would add more detail. If you have a maid or a butler or a servant, they can live there. That's the only way a colored person can live in that house. Others would go into even more detail. Yes, you can have a maid or butler living there, but they must go in through the back door. So racial restrictive covenants have levels of specifics of what they say you can and cannot do when you get ready to sell the house. And again, this is a house you own. So you own the house, but there's restrictions on what you can do when you get ready to move. And Detroit is controlled, or its housing is controlled by this, particularly from the 1920s to the 1960s. But even that view, when we know about Jim Crow or segregation in Detroit, particularly housing segregation. Even that view is limited. So it's definitely true that racial restrictive covenants and other forms of housing discrimination and Detroit's Jim Crow system of segregation deny thousands of African Americans the right to own property, to live and go to school, or to work in certain areas. But even though that's important for us to know, that's not the totality of the story. It's a significant part of a bigger story. Um, be, because what that doesn't say is, well, then what did black people do? It tells us what is done to black people, but it doesn't tell us what black people did. So it denies black people's agency, it still gives whites, in this case racist whites, the credit for creating the community with the richest treasure of African American history and culture in the state of Michigan. And that version of history is flawed. So I'm an African-centered historian. And among other things, what we say when we're African-centered historians is that black people, African people, we are subjects, actors, not merely objects that are acted upon. So we don't just want to know what was done to us. We want to know that. But we also want to know what we did outside of what was done to us. And the other thing we like to do as African-centered scholars, we seek out African sources. Black people, what did black people write and research about our history? We know what some of the other historians have written, and we saw some of the markers and some of the stuff at the Michigan History Center, but we want to know what did black people who researched this, what did they come up with? And so we have to read those sources, and I would argue that all people need to read African-American sources about African-American history. These are two books about Black Bottom and Paradise Valley written by African Americans. Toast to the Town, The Life and Times of Sonny Wilson, and Million Dollars Worth of Nerve, 21 people who helped to power Black Bottom, Paradise Valley, and Detroit's Lower East Side by Ken Coleman. So these are books that people ought to get to find out some of this history. So here's Million Dollars Worth of Nerve, but there's even basic African American history books are necessary. They're not necessary just for students, they're necessary for teachers too. And they're necessary for school curriculum um, advisors. So African American history ought to be a part of all education in the state of Michigan. And um, it ought to also be a part of, I mean, a part of that African American history is African American history from African American sources. So now we're going to get to this history. The Great Migration. Who's heard of the Great Migration? All right, so the Great Migration is a time period in America's history, roughly from the early 1900s to the 1960s, when over half of the African American population is going to leave the South and be um, in a, either the North or the West. So they're going to leave what is known as the Jim Crow South and move to northern, including Midwestern cities, 
in states and western cities and states like LA um, and um, Washington State and Arizona. So um, you can see some of the patterns of migration between 1916 and 1930, which is kind of one of the early legs of the Great Migration. In 1901, I'm sorry, in 1900, 90% of all African Americans lived in a southern state. So in, in, in 1900, 90% of all African Americans lived in a southern state. In 1970, 52% of African Americans live outside of the South. So that period of time is the Great Migration. They left the South. What's happening in the South? So segregation, Jim Crow, an intense version of Jim Crow backed up by violence. So black people can't vote. They can't, they don't have, of course, any civil rights. In some states, they can't own land. Um, in, um, they, many of them are sharecroppers, intended farmers. A sharecropper is just one step above slavery. Because what you do is you work on a large plantation, cotton, tobacco, rice, or some other crop. And the owner of the land does not pay you in cash. They don't pay you money. They pay you with crop. So they give you a portion of the land that you're going to farm. You're going to work for them, but you're going to farm this other part for yourself. You have a share of the crop, sharecropping. And so at the end of the year, the end of the growing season, it's tobacco, it's cotton, it's rice, it's sugar, it's whatever it is. You go and sell. The owner sells his crop, and you go and sell that portion that he gave to you for payment. And that's your pay for the year. And after you've done that, the owner of the land charges you rent for living on his land. So now that you got money, he's going to charge you. So he's going to charge you rent for living on the land. He's going to charge you rent for the tools that you used on, on your crop, which were his tools. He's going to charge you rent for the seed that grew the crop. And by the end of all of these rents, you were in debt. You owed him now. You had paid and now you're in debt. And the only way for you to make up the money is, or to pay him back is to work next year to pay him back. And of course, next year, what's going to happen? You're going to be more in debt. So this is just another form of slavery. And so people are leaving the South. African Americans are leaving the South to get away from this system. Along with this system, every day, between 1916 and 1930, every day, somewhere in some southern state, a black person is being lynched. And some days, two or three black people are being lynched. But every day between those years, at least one black person is killed in some southern state. And so black people are not just leaving for a better economic life, which they can't get being a sharecropper. They're leaving for life itself. They're refugees from terrorism because this is what that is. This is terrorism going on in the South. And so you can see some of the patterns. Most of the patterns follow the train stations, the train routes, and then later the freeways. So you see um, the majority of African Americans who end up in Detroit come from Mississippi and Alabama because the, the trains go straight from Mississippi and Alabama all the way to Detroit. Louisiana, most of them end up in Chicago. Um, one of the reasons they come to the city of Detroit is because Ford, Henry Ford, and there's many other auto factories in Detroit at the time in the early 1900s. It's not just the three like we think of today. There's a whole bunch of them that no, no, no longer exist. But Henry Ford is going to break with the practices of most of the auto factories. Most of the auto factories did one, or two, one of three things when they dealt with African American um, workers. In one case, many, Afri I mean, many factories, they just didn't hire African-American workers. So there were a number of factories that refused to hire African-American workers. Two, factories did hire African-American workers as strike breakers because the unions were all white. The unions were arguably more racist than the factories. And the unions didn't allow African-Americans to be members. And so when the unions went on strike, 
African-American workers weren't part of the unions. And so the, the factories would hire African-American workers as strike breakers. Unions are going to begin bringing in African-Americans as members, not originally because they believed in civil rights, but originally because they were tired of African-American workers being used against the unions. And as African-Americans become members of unions, they're going to, civil rights is going to become a part of the labor movement too. And then the third thing that factories did is they hired African-Americans but they paid them lower wages than white workers. This is what the factories were doing before Ford breaks that practice, a practice he himself was a part of. And that practice is he's now going to offer $5 a day. The going rate, the average rate for most factories in Detroit at that time was about $2.34 a day. So he's going to pay more than double what most factories are paying. And he says he's going to pay it to all workers regardless of race. And so that's going to cause Detroit to be a, a, a site, a major destination point for African Americans under, who are leaving the South during the Great Migration. But there was already a small community of African Americans in the city of Detroit. And so we got to talk about that part to understand two groups, the group of people coming during the Great Migration and the group of people who were already in Detroit. The Underground Railroad is the beginning of the African American community in Black Bottom. So if you want to know where African the African American community in Black Bottom begins, it begins during the fight against slavery. That's where it begins. And first, does anybody know where the term Black Bottom comes from? Any student want to take a chance at that? I know somebody knows. Okay, the easy answer is it comes from black people. And if you came in contact with Black Bottom after the 1930s, that's what most people thought. But before the 1930s, that isn't what it meant. It was still, it had that name, but it wasn't in regards to African Americans. There are creeks and rivers that run all through the Lower East Side that empty out into the Detroit River. Those creeks and rivers that run all through the east side, the largest being the Savoyard River, which is now the Dequindre Cut, empty black soil all over the lower east side. And the French called it Fonois when they arrived in the 1700s be because this black soil was just, it was so rich in, in minerals that you could grow almost anything you wanted in that soil. And because of the French, um, seeing this black soil and naming it Faux Noir, which is Black Bottom, that's where the name originally comes from. Um, but by the 1930s, because African Americans are forced to be in that area m more than any other area in the city of Detroit they're not allowed to live in, it becomes known, people associated with black people. But African Americans involved in the Underground Railroad is where this black community starts. This man is named William Lambert. He's one of the leaders of the Underground Railroad. That's the historic marker that used to sit at his home site. So um, his home site is in the Lower East Side, right next to the Martin Luther King Jr. homes um, on St. Alban and Larned. That's the home of William Webb. Um, and the, the other picture is the, historical, the Detroit Historical Museum, where they talk about William Lambert and William Webb, but this is William Webb's home on St. Antoine in Congress. And his home was a station on the Underground Railroad. And William Webb could pass for white. And he used that ability to spy on slave catchers as, a, as an agent of the Underground Railroad. Right across the street, from William Webb's house is where St. Matthew's Episcopal Church is going to be founded. And St. Matthew's is the third black church in the city of Detroit. That's a picture of it at the top where it was on St. Antoine in Congress. It's a parking lot there today, but that was the third black church. It was part of the Underground Railroad. Um, when they moved to Paradise Valley, basically where Ford Field's parking deck is today, this is what it looks like. 
So the Ford Field parking deck used to be the site of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, the third black church found in the city of Detroit in 1845. This is the historical marker on the Ford Field parking deck that tells us what was there before Ford Field was there. But what you also need to know is that the African-American community, particularly Black Bottom, is highly related to Jewish, the Jewish community in Detroit. African-American settlement follows Jewish migration in and around the city of Detroit. Black people move to where Jewish people already live or have just moved from. So one, part one, that's Black Bottom. So the area where black people live is also the area where Jewish people live. Part two is Paradise Valley. So where African Americans set up their business district is where Jewish people already had a, a residential and business district. Three and four, three is the North End. Four is the Virginia Park near West Side, Dexter, Linwood neighborhood. Five, far northwest side of Detroit. And then you can even start leaving Detroit. Uh, Oak Park and Southfield. So. You, the point is, African-American migration follows Jewish migration in and around the city of Detroit. And we already kind of know why, because African-Americans are discriminated against in, in um, restrictive covenants, and Jewish people are many times also restricted. Jewish residents would be the group of people least likely to practice racial restrictive covenants on the group that follows them. So other groups who had problems getting homes would move into areas where Jewish people lived prior. And African Americans would be one of those groups. So that's the pattern of Jewish settlement, which is basically the pattern of African American migration around the city of Detroit. And so on the left is the home of Isaac and Sarah Cousins, and on the right, is the home of William Webb. William Webb is a leader of the Underground Railroad. John Brown would come to his house to hide 13 people who he's helping escape from slavery, and he's gonna take them over to Canada. While he's here, he's gonna meet with Frederick Douglass in this house and tell Frederick Douglass about his plans to attack Harper's Ferry and arm the um, enslaved African Americans so that they can fight for their freedom. It's in Detroit that he tells Frederick Douglass to his plans. Frederick Douglass disagrees with the plan because he doesn't think the plan is going to work. But they talk about it right here in the city, of, right in the city of Detroit on the corner of St. Antoine and Congress. Basically, next door is the home of Isaac and Sarah Cousins. What has happened there? Isaac and Sarah Cousins are going to found the first Jewish congregation, at least in their home, they're going to found the first Jewish congregation in the state of Michigan, Temple Bethel. It's going to be founded in the home of Isaac and Sarah Cousins. So you have the Underground Railroad and the first Jewish congregation in the state right next door to one another. This is really a foundation of a relationship because African Americans who live in the Lower East Side don't live there by themselves in the 1800s and the early 1900s. They live there with immigrants, German immigrants, Polish immigrants, Irish immigrants, Italians, Greeks. Greek town is really part of Black Bottom. It's in the lower east side of the city of Detroit. African Americans are living there alongside Greek uh, immigrants. Before them, German immigrants, Russian immigrants, Polish immigrants, Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants. And those immigrants face discrimination when they come to this country. They face discrimination in some cases because of their religion, if they're Jewish, and in some cases Catholic. They face um, discrimination because they're from another country. In 1924, the federal government is going to pass a, a new immigration law that's going to restrict Southern Europeans and heighten Northern Europeans' ability to come and exclude Chinese from coming at all. So this is the time period when immigrants are facing high levels of discrimination. And so people coming from Italy and Greece and the Slavic countries are being discriminated against, and they live right alongside African Americans in Black Bottom. Their children 
their grandchildren, and definitely their grand, great-grandchildren face far less discrimination than their forebears. The people who came and spoke either with a, an accent or didn't speak English faced a higher level of discrimination than their grandchildren. And gradually, many of these immigrants from Europe began to be treated as if they were just white people. But African Americans would not be treated that way, whether they were first, second, third, or fourth generation. And so they'll remain in Black Bottom while gradually those other groups will begin to move away from Black Bottom. So Greeks will move out of Greek town. It, 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 Italians will move into uh, Macomb County. Um, Jewish people will, they will face the longest time of, of being able to move besides African Americans. But Germans who are not Jewish and Polish people will move eventually into Hamtramck. And African Americans will stay in Black Bottom um, while all those other groups eventually will be able to move out. But there's a time period when they're right next to each other. Temple Bethel, of course, is no longer in Detroit, but that's where it was founded, on the corner of St. Antoine and Congress. These are the historic markers for Temple Bethel and William Webb's house where Frederick Douglass and John Brown met on the corner of St. Antoine and Congress. As you can see, the historic markers are right next to each other. Across the street was St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. Paradise Valley is the black business district. It is not primarily residential. Black Bottom is primarily residential, although it had businesses. Paradise Valley is predominantly business, although it had residents. Paradise Valley um, no longer exists. A freeway runs through the main street that was, Paradise, that was in Paradise Valley, Hastings Street. That is now I-75. And when you're in downtown, it's I-375. What's also in Paradise Valley is where the Lions um, play football, or on some days, attempt to play football. <laughs> so Ford Field, Comerica Park, where the Tigers play baseball, was, would have been a part of Paradise Valley. So the freeway, Ford Field, the Ford Field parking deck, Comerica Park, all of that would have been the black business district. 350 black-owned businesses there by the 1930s. In 1941, during the Great Depression, well, in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra closed. The building they were housed in was foreclosed on by the city. The city was going to destroy Orchestra Hall. There was going to be no orchestra, no Detroit Symphony Orchestra, and no Orchestra Hall. A group of African Americans who had become millionaires because of the businesses that they were involved in in Paradise Valley said, no, no, don't close it. We'll take it over. And they turned the Detroit Symphony Orchestra Hall into the Paradise Theater, named after Paradise Valley. And from 1941 to 1951, big band, swing musicians, some later soul and R&B, early R&B um, performers and uh, other performers would perform there. And that's why we have an orchestra hall right now. The reason orchestra hall didn't get uh, bulldozed after doing the, um, the Great Depression is because African Americans who were part of Paradise Valley saved it. And so now the Detroit Symphony Orchestra is back there. But it wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for these black businesses. And this is a story that people know nothing about. That's Hastings Street. That's the main street of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, where the businesses are. So those, you can see the business frontage. This is where the clubs, the restaurants, the hotels, the, and some of the churches were. The 606 Horseshoe Lounge, the um, Raymond Sport Trees Music Aquarium, um, New Bethel Baptist Church was at 4626 Hastings Street. You may know New Bethel. 
because his pastor, his most famous pastor, was Reverend Clarence LaVon Franklin. And if you don't know Reverend Clarence LaVon Franklin, I'm sure you know his daughter Aretha Franklin. So the church was originally on Hastings Street. When the freeway got built, New Bethel, Reverend Franklin and Aretha's church had to move off of the street because the freeway takes over this. All those African-American owned businesses are taken by eminent domain. The city takes the land. That's when the government says we want to use this land. And the go government gives you what they think the land is worth. This is what happened to Paradise Valley. This is why this black business district was destroyed. That's one of the clubs that comes out of, the Par out of Paradise Valley, the Flame Show Bar, owned by a Jewish business na man named Morris Wasserman. He partners with African-American um, business owners and performers to create this club on the corner of John R. and Canfield in 1949. It's there from 1949 to 1963. Its band leader, Maurice King, is a big band leader. He's going to one day leave and become the music director at Motown Records. The, uh, many of the performers who perform there, the, the Matadors are one of the performers. Um, Harvey in the Moonglows is another one of the big performers there. Well, there's a photo concession business inside of the club. You know when you go to the club, you got to take pictures. So if I was at the club with my wife, we'd take our picture like this. And in those days, they had the big old camera, and you know, they would take the picture, and then at the end, before you leave, you get it, they put it in a little um, booklet like that that opens up like that, you put it on your mantle. So every time me and my wife would walk by in the house, we'd be like, remember we was at the club? <laughs> Man, look at my suit, look at my shoes. Oh, you look good, but you don't look good as me. But even if I was at the club by myself, I'm still gonna take that picture. It's just gonna look a little different. You gotta take the picture. The owners of the photo concession are two sisters, Anna and Gwen Gordy. They have a little brother named Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy. And they know everybody who comes in and out of that club. And they introduce him to all of these performers, Jackie Wilson, the Matadors, who are going to become the Miracles. Harvey in the Moon Glows, Harvey Fuqua is the band leader. He's going to end up becoming the manager of many of the, uh, of the artists at Motown. And the lead singer of the Moon Glows is a guy from Washington, D.C. named Marvin Pence Gay II, but you know him simply as Marvin Gay. Because of this club that comes out of Paradise Valley, you get Motown. Motown comes from Paradise Valley. Paradise Valley comes from Black Bottom. Black Bottom's black community comes from the Underground Railroad and the Great Migration. The black community in the city of Detroit is founded on a fight for freedom, not on that other stuff that you might have heard of. So there's Hastings Street, I-75 and I-375 replaced Hastings Street. Hastings Street ran from the Detroit River going north to East Grand Boulevard. That's Hastings and Gratiot in 1956. This is the black business strip. Before that, it was the Jewish business strip. So there is the street and there's the freeway. So you can see them juxtapose one against each other. So at the top, that's Paradise Valley when Hastings Street was the black business strip, and that's when they um, destroyed Paradise Valley to create the I-75 freeway. And I'm going to end a couple of minutes here. Even education is tied to this history. So I'm out of school, so I got to talk about school for just a minute. This is Miller High School. Miller High School was built in 1919 as Dubois Intermediate School. It was a middle school. And who lives in, in Black Bottom in 1919? African Americans, Polish, Germans, Jewish people, Irish, a few Italians, and a few Greeks live in 
black bottom. So African Americans live alongside all these immigrants, and the school is for them. The main elementary school is Duffield, the main middle school is Miller, and the high school is Eastern High School, which was on Mac and the Boulevard back then. That's what we say in Detroit, we call it the Boulevard. You might know it as Grand Boulevard, but we call it the Boulevard. If you call it Grand, we know you're not from the city of Detroit. And some of the parents, I mean, just to make it clear, some of the white parents were upset that so many African Americans were moving into this neighborhood and ending up in high school with their children. And they pressured the Detroit Public Schools Board to do something about it. So what the Detroit Public School Board does is they rezone the students. African American students, not every single one of them, but almost every single one of them, are zoned to this school for high school. The Miller becomes, instead of a middle school, which it was built to be, it becomes a high school. Um, white students are zoned to Eastern. So Eastern becomes the white high school, and Miller, which was a middle school, becomes the black high school in the same neighborhood. So you have African Americans and whites who go to separate high schools who live a block away from one another. This was done purposefully for high school. The white parents weren't so upset about elementary, and they weren't so upset about middle school. I'll let you figure out why the problem was high school. Eastern moves, and this is the policy in Detroit from 1933 to 1957. After 1957, they get rid of that, and now African Americans can start going to Eastern all over again. Eastern moves in 1966. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated in 1968. Eastern becomes Martin Luther King Jr. High School. The former white high school is named after Martin Luther King Jr. Miller, the black high school, is named after a white um, school board president, Sidney Miller. That's the irony of racism in Detroit's history. And I'm going to end on this story, which is the founding of the African American community in the city of Detroit. In 1831, two people escaped from slavery in Louisville, Kentucky, Thornton and Rutha Blackburn. So it's 1831. They escape, they come to the city of Detroit. Detroit, um, while they're here, they're making a living for themselves. But eventually, two slave catchers, bounty hunters, come to the city of Detroit to capture them and take them back. They're assisted by the sheriff and deputy who captured Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn and put them inside of the old Detroit jail, which sat behind what is now the CompuWare building in downtown Detroit. The CompuWare building sits right next to Campus Marshes in downtown Detroit, where the ice skating rink is during the winter. The old jail sat right behind it. There's a Skillman library there now. But that's where the old jail was. And they're kept in that jail until they're going to be put on a boat to take back down um, to Ohio and eventually back into Kentucky. Thornton escaped with his wife, Rutha, because she had been sold down into New Orleans as a fancy woman. Now, that might sound good, but ain't nothing fancy about a fancy woman. It's sexual slavery. It's where the woman is forced into prostitution, and her enslaver makes the money from that forced prostitution. And so Thornton escapes with her to escape that. Now they're captured, they're held in a jail, and a group of black people, led by two black women, I want you to know their names, Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot. Caroline who? French. Tabitha what? Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot are leaders of a meeting to free Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn, which overthrows another myth about the Underground Railroad and black history in general, that men did everything. When history happened, women were doing all the great things that we say men only did. When history is told, it's told as if men did it all. Harriet Tubman is not the exception. That's the way the Underground Railroad and every other movement went. Black women were doing, and women in general, were doing all the same things that men were doing. They weren't just serving tea and cookies. They're leaders at this meeting, and they say, we got to free Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn, and they come up with a plan. And on Sunday, after they all go to church, they come down to the jail to visit Rutha and Thornton Blackburn. Everybody that came to visit Thornton is turned away. You can't come here. He's not allowed any visitors. They're scared of this black man. They believe he's a threat. 
So they're not letting anybody visit him. But they're not afraid of this black woman and they don't consider her a threat, so they let her have visitors. They didn't consider this black woman a threat. First mistake. Because when Caroline French and Top of the Life were going to the jail cell with her, they brought her some food because they know jail food is, is horrible. It was definitely was horrible in 1830, 1831. It's still horrible. Don't ask me how I know. But they prayed with her because they believe that prayer works. And while they're in the jail cell, Caroline French switches clothes with Ruth the Blackburn inside of the jail cell. When the sheriff says visiting time is over, you got to get out of here. Tabitha Lightfoot walks out with Ruth the Blackburn wearing Caroline French's clothes. The sheriff doesn't even know that the woman he should be holding has walked by, and the woman who should have been walking by is in the jail cell wearing the other woman's clothes. To him, all these women look alike. They put her on a boat, she's over to Canada, and she is free. The next morning, when it's time for them to go back down to slavery, Caroline French says, you who, Mr. Sheriff, I'm Caroline French. I came here yesterday to visit Ruth the Blackburn while I was in the jail cell, so I switched clothes with her. She walked right by you and you ain't even know. We put her on the boat and now she's in Canada and she's free because that was our plan. And I'm free too. You got to let me go. My husband can bring you any documentation you need, but you're going to let me go. Bounty hunters, slave catchers are bounty hunters. They only get money if they bring the people back. They lost half of their bounty. So they like, you switch with her? You're going to really switch with her and we're going to take you back in, instead. And Caroline French said, I'm from Detroit. Plus, I'm from the east side. That's not going down. And when they walk out of the jail cell, there's 400 African-American abolitionists with guns, poles, sticks, bricks, knives, swords. And there's white abolitionists who are out there with them. And they look at Caroline French and say, you know what, have a good day. See you later. Thanks. And they think the crowd is going to leave. But the crowd is there for Thornton, too. And to make this story short, in the course of this fight, the sheriff is killed by this crowd. Thornton is put on a wagon and is sent over to Canada, and he is freed in Canada and reunited with his wife. They end up in Toronto, where they're going to start the first taxi company in Toronto. Not the first black taxi cab company, the first taxi company, and they're going to become wealthy. They're going to build five other homes for other people who escaped from slavery and need a place to stay and food to eat. They're going to build a safe house for other people who went through what they went through. And the president of the United States, the governor of Michigan, and the mayor are going to try to get Canada to send them back. Canada is going to come up with a ruling that is still a Canadian precedent and law to this day. And that ruling is Canada will never send back anybody who's a fugitive from another country, even if they have an extradition treaty with that country, if they face a penalty higher than they could ever face in Canada. Today, that law applies to the death penalty. So people who escape some country and are facing the death penalty back at home, Canada won't send them back because Canada doesn't have a death penalty. But that's because of what happened in Detroit on June 17th, 1833, when they freed Thornton and Ruth, when Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn escaped from slavery. And so Canada becomes the destination point for the Underground Railroad from that point forward. Now Harriet Tubman starts taking people to Canada. She wasn't doing that before. William Lloyd Garrison in Massachusetts is taking people to Canada. He wasn't doing that before. Levi Kaufman is doing it. William Steele is doing it because of what happened in downtown Detroit on June 17, 1833. Detroit makes Canada the destination point for the Underground Railroad. The people who freed Thornton and Ruth of Blackburn three years later will be the founders of Second Baptist Church. The first black church in the state of Michigan. It is now on, in Greektown on the corner of Monroe and Bobian. It's been there since 1857, but it was founded in 1836. This becomes the headquarters of the Underground Railroad. Out of that church, 30 churches come out of that church, and those churches become the foundation of the black community. Three churches are in Canada that come out of that church, and one church that comes out of Second Baptist is New Bethel, Reverend Clarence LeVon Franklin's church and Aretha's church. So the freedom of black people is how Black Bottom and Paradise Valley were founded. Thank you for listening.
Okay, we're going to take questions now. So does anybody have any questions about what they heard? Thank you. So she's going to ask. Go ahead. Okay, so that movie called Detroit, was that like based on Paradise Valley or Black Rock? See, good question. So the movie Detroit came out last year in August. Um, it was highlighting part of the 1967 rebellion or uprising in the city of Detroit. You may also know it as the 1967 riot. Um, and it's talking about the near west side. So that is an area that African Americans are going to move to after Black Bottom and Paradise Valley are destroyed. So when Black Bottom, they begin destroying Black Bottom in 1949, um, by 1956 or so, Black Bottom is mostly done, is mostly destroyed. They begin destroying Paradise Valley in 1956. By 1963, it's basically gone. And so African Americans have been moving during that time period from the 1940s to um, the 1960s into the near west side, which is the Dexter, Linwood, 12th Street neighborhood. Who was just there as they were moving in? Who was beginning to move out? Jewish people are moving out. So they're moving into a formerly Jewish community. So that's the near west side, Virginia Park, 12th Street, Dexter, Linwood, Grand Boulevard area, West Grand Boulevard area where Motown is. That's the neighborhood, it's not Black Bottom, it's the people who've left Black Bottom because Black Bottom got destroyed. That's where that is, yep. Good question. I no other questions? No other hands? What? I see a hand. Up front. It's one up front. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know what are some of the books that you recommended Good question. So her question, the question on the floor was, what books? So a basic book. It don't have to be this one. But a basic book on African American history, everybody should have one in their library. Not that you're going to sit down and read it straight cover to cover, but you can consult it as a, as a, as a resource because um, Wikipedia is not sufficient. So a basic African American historical text. Now, of course, mine is well used, and I keep trying to tape the cover and it keeps coming off, but this is the Detroit Almanac. Uh, Peter Gravilovich and Bill McGraw um, did this book. It's again a resource, not something you're going to probably read from cover to cover, but you will be able to consult it to be able to put people in places conne and connect those dots. It's a book that everybody should have to understand Detroit's history, including its African American history. But of course, you got to get some African American sources. So, this is a fluid frontier. Slavery, Resistance, and the Underground Railroad in the Detroit River borderland. This is kind of the foundation of the African American community, this fight for freedom. And this, this one is the same. Forbidden Fruit, Love Story from the Underground Railroad by Betty DeRamis, who's a Detroit historian. Who, many of these stories talk about what happened to create Black Bottom during the Underground Railroad, including the Thornton and Ruth Blackburn story, because even though that's a freedom story, that's a love story. The fact that he escaped because of, they escaped because of what was going to happen to her. So it's a love story and it's in this book. It's the second chapter of this book. Untold Tales, Unsung Heroes, An Oral History of Detroit's African American Community from 1918 to 1967 by Elaine Moon. Good source. And I'll leave these up here. Anybody want to come up later at the end and take pictures of them? That's fine. Um, and then I already told you this one, Million Dollars Worth of Nerve and um, The Making of Black Detroit in the Age of Henry Ford. So these are books, good sources, and you can come up at the end and take pictures of them. I see some other hands. I was just wondering if there was a website to go to to find more information. Oh, okay. So, uh, y'all heard that. Uh, so is there a website that you can find more information? So there's a lot of websites that you can find more information, but more information about what I do, um, you can find at, and, and you can come up at the end and I can 
tell you if you won't remember this, but blackscrollnetwork at gmail.com. You can email me your questions or comments, and I can respond to you that way. Or you can go to my Facebook page, Black Scroll Network History and Tours. So that's the, that's the Facebook page, Black Scroll Network History and Tours. All right? All right, I think we had one final question, and then um, afterward we're going to thank Jermon Jordan, and we're going to go back to our classes for attendance. But I did have one other question. Somebody was wondering, how did you get started doing this? Oh, so um, the first thing I want to um, say how I got started in doing this is, uh, let's see. So, my father lived in Black Bottom before it was destroyed. So that's him on the left. So that's me, my sister, and my older brother, and my father on the left. He grew up in Black Bottom, but of course he was forced to move when they destroyed Black Bottom. My wife's father and, he, and my father were schoolmates. We didn't know that when we met, but we found out later that they went to school together. So he was also in Black Bottom. So this, a lot of this story is my story. I, I didn't know it was my story, but it's my story. But I was a teacher. I was a teacher uh, for 20 years, and I was a social studies teacher. And I was teaching um, the hi history, geography, government, econ, um, current events. So all of that kind of stuff, that's what I was teaching. But the curriculum, nor the textbooks, included Detroit. Detroit shows up, Henry Ford, and Motown. That's how it shows up in the textbook. So all this other history, Underground Railroad, that's Harriet Tubman them on the wet, in the East Coast. Civil Rights Movement, that's the South. Montgomery and Selma, Mississippi. The Black Power Movement, that's Oakland, California, in Chicago, in New York. Detroit plays a part in all of these movements, but it's missing in the curriculum and it's missing in the textbooks. And I thought, just as it's wrong to teach about history and not teach African American history, it's also wrong to teach history and not teach women's history. I, it's also wrong to teach history or government or geography and not teach Detroit history and government if you're in a class full of people in Detroit. How are you going to be in Detroit and you don't talk about Detroit? So I began to include it, even though it wasn't in the textbook. I began to include Detroit's history and talk about some of the stuff I was talking about. And the students would go home and tell their parents about this history and the parents didn't believe it. They're like, that ain't happened in Detroit. He made that up. And so I began to take them on field trips to these historic sites. And the parents would come so that I could prove that, yes, this did happen in Detroit. So we would go to these historic sites. And after they went, they began to want to bring other people. Now, I can't do that. I can't bring strangers on field trips with kids, with students. So I began to do this on my own after school and on the weekends and in the summers. And now it's what I do full time. After teaching for 20 years in a classroom, I teach in a much bigger classroom than I used to. All right, so that's how it happened.